One second, everybody. Today's a big day. We're gonna have our second star guest, season two, episode two. Be Rob Roy, engineer, producer, musician, rock star, power station studio from Pompano Beach, Florida. Owner, yeah. operator, yeah, power station. Woo! Yeah. Anyway, we stick look forward with to us. it. Yes. Anything you want to add about Rob? He's a great guy. He's a great guy. He's a great engineer. Got a lot of great stories. So stick around. We got Rob Roy from the Power Station coming up. Hey, ah, uh. forward to having them. Stick around, just coming right up on Soundcheck. Right now, our Robinette, Jason Sedowie. One, two, three, and... Oh, uh. yeah. Hey, everybody. Say hi, Daisy. Hey, hey. Let's get a round of applause to everybody. Here we are back at Soundcheck. This is, what will this be, episode two? Episode two. Episode season two. two. Yep. Season two. And man, last week was fantastic, but this week, even better. We're rocking. So here we are once again. My name is Jim Robinette. Keith this Ridenauer. is Keith Ridenauer. Jason said we are producer. Jason, good to have you here today. And once again... Here it is, our guest, Rob Roy, everybody. Hey, buddy boy. In the house. Hey. I'd like to introduce Rob and yeah, where you absolutely. know Rob from. This is our good friend, Rob Roy, from Power Station Studios and Bon jo Jovi Acoustics. And uh, how you doing, bro? I'm hanging in there, yeah. man. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me, and I'm excited to do this. So what's going on? How's the studio? Let's, go, let's start with the studio first. What's going on at studio? Studio is doing great. I, you know, it, it, it's funny, you know. When COVID came along, it changed the game for everything. Right, right. And oddly enough, you know, when we went, when we kind of stepped back and like, okay, what's going on? Um, I, I knew what a pandemic could do. I had no, no idea what it really would do. Right, right. But, you know, I, I went back and uh, went to the bank, got a, a line of credit. And, you know, I sat all the guys down. I said, look, guys, nobody's losing their house on my watch. I said, I'm prepared to write checks. I, I, I've got credit. I've got this. Nobody's going nowhere. We got, this. you know, so during the lockdown, we were lucky because of our parallel life of technology, audio technology with the Bon Jovi Acoustics and Bon Jovi Medical and Clear 360 Ventures and all this stuff. So we were actually able to stay open while we didn't have foot traffic. But while everybody was on lockdown, we actually you know, I printed out papers of, with everybody so that they got stopped or whatever. Right. Um, so we did a lot of remote stuff. And you know, because I had, P I was the first in the line for PPE and EIDL and all that. So I had money to pay the guys, but we didn't have work. Right. So we started this campaign, this power station pays it forward. And people would just post videos on our, our social timelines. And every week I would take all those videos, write them down on a piece of paper, crumple them up, put them all in my hand, whip them down the hallway, whichever land first got 10 hour block of free studio time. So people started coming back and I don't know what happened, but it kind of spiraled and 2020 ended up being one of the biggest years the studio ever had. Really? And then we just kind of kept growing and growing. And, and, you know, again, this is 23 years of being in business, but uh, it just, it pushed us up another notch. And, you know, we're doing multiple sessions a day and, you know, two rooms that are, you know, booked multiple sessions each room. And, it, you know, it, it's a blessed situation, but we're doing all right. Right. We're hanging in there. Well, for anybody out there who doesn't know where Power Station Studios are, are, is, and uh, about the two rooms. Let's talk about the two rooms. So let's talk about the A room. Okay, so you know the studio, is, as I was telling you earlier, it actually started as an accident. The, the A room, which is our, the, the first bay that we took over in, in Pompton, which is what I call Pompano, especially that area. Pompton. 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 <laughs> I was wondering what he was talking about earlier. But, uh, I, had, uh, I was doing a joint venture with the labels, and I had raised uh, private investment to do a record, and we were going to go to Power Station New York to do it. And, um, you know, you know, you don't get a, a check for, you know, whatever, you know, you have to do a, a timeline and a drawdown schedule. Right. And I was just getting ready to submit the drawdown schedule to do the, you know, start booking the studio and 
you know, what, who I was bringing from Florida up to New York and what guys I would and gals I would need up there. So just as I'm getting ready to do this, 9-11 happened. And my investors were heavy into aviation. And I get the phone call and they're like, you know, look, Rob, your deal's good, but it's just got to wait. And, uh, you know, we didn't plan on a uh, plane flying into a building in this and that. And we got helicopter tour companies and all this aviation stuff. So I'm like, all right, I understand. No problem. Now I'm working with, you know, a, a young singer, you know, young, young female singer. My buddy was a bass player, co-writer of the, some of the stuff. And so, you know, they're all, you know, we got the opportunity of a lifetime and now all of a sudden pull the brakes on it. You know, in any, any venture, whether it's music, business, this and that, morale is a key component to oh, yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know, I'm like, all right, guys, you know, we just got to wait. And the waiting game was just creating such tension and stuff. I had to do something. I've had studios all my life, you know, project studios for my own stuff. Right, uh, right. You know, I, I started in the studio world because I couldn't afford to go to studios. So I've just figured it out and did it myself. Right. So, you know, I've got Tony Bon Jovi who built the legendary power station in New York, which is arguably the most decorated studio in the world. I got him in my back pocket. So I find a little empty warehouse in Pompton and, you know, I got a couple of credit cards, I borrowed a credit card from my dad and just built it out, makeshift of where we could, you know, pre-production, uh, we could do, you know, if we had to, we could start the foundation tracks. And the goal was, is that when the financing came back, we just abandon it and finish it in New York. Um, so along the way, you know, tensions are getting there. I'm looking at these credit card bills coming in and I'm starting to sweat a little bit. Then the phone starts ringing. Yo, Rob, I hear you got a studio set up. Do you think uh, you can track some stuff for it for me? I'm like, look at the credit card bills. Come on the fuck down. Yeah. <laughs> How fast can you get yeah, here? Yeah, come on over. So it, it kind of turned into I'm working on my project during the day and then twisting knobs for anybody and their mom at nighttime just to keep the bills paid and keep my, you know, my nose above water type right, of a thing. Right. Um, so, you know, that was going on for a little while. And then the, the project kind of went from the side burner to the back burner and then fell off the back of the stove. But the studio was left there. And then uh, labels found out that Tony was producing records out of a studio in Pompton. Um, and we started getting some label work. So uh, from there, I was like, all right, well, I need more space. I need to, you know, expand. So we took over another bay in this complex and I built a second studio, a lounge and an office. And that's kind of how it kind of came about. And then um, in 2016, I had an opportunity to sell my soul to the devil, which I happily did. But um, so at that time, I had an opportunity to pick up a uh, the Rupert Neve 9098i uh. console. <laughs> so you know, back in you know in our days, it was you know you're either for the most part you're a Neve guy or an SSL guy. I right. was always a Neve guy. Um, and I had worked on a couple of these, one of my mentors, uh, a guy named Ron St. Germain, who's, you know, produced and mixed for, you know, a litany of, of hit records, everything from, you know, Michael Jackson to Soundgarden to 311 to Scott Stapp to Creed, and the list goes on and on. And I, I worked on a lot of sessions with him. He had a 9098. Now, mind you, there was only 23 ever made in the world. But for the people, I got to interrupt you. For the people who are listening, tell them what that is. They have no idea what it is. Yeah. Some of our listeners. You're talking about your mixing console. So the big mixing console that, that, that you see in all these movies, these giant, you know, they're size of a house kind of a thing. So this is a Rupert Neve 9098i. Um, okay, gotcha. It is probably, it was Rupert's flagship console. Um, it was the, the creme de la creme and arguably the best sounding super analog large format console ever made. Okay, There's only got 23 it. in the world made. Only nine made it to the Holy United shit. States. 23 in the world, man. And uh, so, you know, Ron had one, Ron St. Germain 311 had one. And then I get a call from my console tech who was out of Nashville. He actually had worked for a company called Amec, who was the manufacturer of Rupert's console. So he calls me one day. He's like, Rob, I got a 9098 uh, here. Uh, you want one? And I was like, uh, well, there's a bear shit in the woods. He goes, I got it. You want it? I'm like, I can't afford that. And he goes, no, seriously, I got one. I'm like, Dave, stop fucking with me. Leave me alone. You know, he always screws with me. You know, we become friends over the years. Right, and right. You know, when he comes in to do a tech job, he stays at my house and, you know, type of thing. And I'm finally like, you know, Dave, forget it. I, I, I don't have that kind of budget. Stop screwing with me. And he's like, Rob, shut the fuck up for a second and listen to me. So he explains the situation that he's picking up this console as part as a uh, payment as installing the new console and, and so forth. And he's like, I got it for pennies on the dollar. Go figure it out. So I talked to finance companies, this and that. And, you know, thank God I actually had decent credit. You know, when they first, uh, the, con the finance company he first turned me on to, you know, we all, small studio, it's not like we could afford a lot of things and we just paid for things as right. we could afford it. We never financed anything, so we had no credit. 
You know, in, in a lot of cases, no credit's worse than bad credit. But I personally had good credit. So I go to the finance company. They're like, well, we'll give you X number of dollars. And I'm like, well, that ain't going to help me anything. And he, he's like, you got to put me first. Oh, well, this, that. And you know, right, screw you. So I went and found another finance company. Put you company. first as far as the lien. Put you first on the loan. Yeah. As first, opposed number to your one business. Then the main guarantor. As I mean, I'm the owner business. of the business. I'm the guarantor anyway. Right. You're, so, the, you're the one signing But they for wouldn't it. do that. So I went to another finance company and they're like, you got to put me first. Like, I don't care where we put you. You're, you're the guarantor anyway. So they put it, we got the financing and we got this console. And that really changed the game. So we have this big 72 channel console. It's got like 160 inputs. How did you get it in the building? <laughs> because I know places, private people that have had not that console, but similar SSLs and, and things oh, like it's that. No they joke. had to take the roof off. So no, we didn't have to go that far. Fortunately, this thing was, it's, you have your center bucket and you have your two big buckets. So we ended up taking, pull the legs off, put it on its back to roll it into the door. Uh -huh. um, and that was before the, you know, the, the, uh, the credenza or the producer's desk with all the right. gear. So we got it in that way. And uh, it was about two weeks to install that thing. But uh, we've got it in there and, and it literally was a game changer. Um, you know, over the years in building the studio, I couldn't afford a big console like that. So I always invested in outboard gear. So we have a plethora of like vintage and modern outboard gear. We've got like big pull tech equalizers from 1951, which are like the holy grail of equalization. Um, we've got modules that came out of a vintage Neve console. And, and the story has it, the ones that I have came out of a console that was once owned by the band The Clash. Um, and then uh, we've even got some original Motown EQs that came from Motown Records. So I have a lot of this outboard gear. Right. And then bringing in this console all of a sudden put us up at the echelon of the world's greatest studios out there. And we just kept building and building. And you know, we got a nice live room in there with uh, you know 16 foot ceilings. And, and uh, we just kind of kept growing and growing. And, and then uh, even during COVID, in my Studio B, we had a, 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 a Amec Neve Media 5.1 in there. The problem in that room is that everybody just used two little channels. Right, you know, right. They wouldn't use the whole console. And I'm spending money to maintain this thing for two, con two channels. If they wanted to use the whole console, they'd go into Studio A. So what ends up happening, those two rooms start to you know, compete against each other. Right. So what I did was is I sold the console in Studio B, and I did a complete hybrid system, digital hybrid system. So it, it completely mirrors Studio A. So any mic path or anything that you do in Studio A can be recreated in B. Sessions can go back and forth. We could fly, you know, session work back and forth. So we created the epitome of a hybrid system, full digital, full analog that works together. So we've got two massively functional rooms. And Do you have many people where there, there's one session going on in each room? Or are they mixing in B or, or, or doing both? What are they doing? So, you know, Studio A is obviously for the bigger stuff, right. for, for, you know, especially with the live Band. room, drums, bands. We do a lot of orchestral stuff. We do string sections, horn sections. Uh, we just had, uh, we did a project with the Count Basie Orchestra in there. Uh, jazz project, which is really cool. Uh, artist uh, Deborah Silver, um, great artist, and uh, she worked with the. Uh, she had uh, Charlie Colello as the arranger, who is known as the Debbie hitman. Silver, she's local. Yeah, she's local. Yeah, she's yeah. a jazz singer. Yep, yeah, she's a jazz singer. Yeah, I've I've, I've booked her a few. Yeah, yeah Charlie Debbie Colello Silver. was the producer on there uh, with uh, Steve Jordan. Uh, he's now the drummer of uh, the Rolling Stones. Um, Charlie Colello, he went. He goes back as far he as sounds familiar. So he goes back as far as the. Four, he was one of the original Four Seasons when, when they were the Four Lovers, and then as uh, they went into the Four Seasons, I, he kind of stepped back yeah, to do the arranging. And he did. And, you know, he arranged uh, a lot of the the. Uh, <laughs> the foot the just, tick, uh, the just tick. stop it. <laughs> I'm just fucking with. You. I got to fuck with you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Charlie arranged a lot of the Four Seasons stuff. Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett. One of the more famous songs that he did was. Uh, Sweet Caroline, bum, bum, wow. bum. Those three notes are hits. Yeah. So, yeah. He, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, he was called the hitman back in the day. He had so many hits. Um, his, his Charlie Carella. Colello. 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 A Colello. brilliant guy. We, I, I'm actually a business partner with him in a couple of other endeavors, but uh, uh, he, great arranger, super, super nice guy, super talented guy. But we do a lot, we do a lot of different things. Uh, right. Everything from rock, rap, country, bluegrass, you know, classical, jazz, big band, you, you name it. Um, one of the things that really is the key focus of that studio 
look, we have a lot of nice gear. I mean, our mic collection is ridiculous. You know, a lot of these vintage I mics and stuff. I remember last time I was over and you showed me that one mic in the vault. Yeah, that was the... Uh, Crazy. The, so that was the Telefunken EL, ELAM 251. Do you use it at all? We do use it. Um, you know, it's a very expensive mic. So, you know, it, it gets... There, there's That's one of the few things that only come out a certain amount of time. Right. But interestingly enough, uh, I was working with a buddy of mine, and he's one of these big producers now, a guy named Keith Ross. Um, he founded a company called Circle Audio, which him and his partner Langston Massingale from LMI uh, Engineering, they've kind of Langston has created this 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 interesting transformer, you know, layers of of nickel and steel, all this crazy out there thinking stuff, and they created this microphone called the Evo Two Fifty One. And so we got the circuit, he got the circuit up and we got out and we shot it out against my vintage ELAM 251, which goes for tens of thousands of dollars at this point. And this has a price point of what, $18.99. And it's shit all over the Telefunken. So, um, you know, I was, I actually was lucky enough to get serial number one off the production line. And now I'm jockeying to get a bunch more. So, you know, for $18.99, you can get a microphone. That Literally $18 just, a night? No, or eighteen hundred and ninety nine dollars. I was going to say eighteen hundred. I was like I want a And the noise floor on it's like eighteen hundred bucks, non-existent. But uh, damn. So you know, digital's brought a lot of different game right, changes. Right. But you know, we got a you know we've got you know Telefunkens. We got the U eighty sevens, U sixty seven tubes, U sixty fours, Telefunken, uh, the U forty sevens, the Frank Sinatra mics you see. So you know, wow. parlayed with all that stuff. You know, we got a lot of great gear, but you know. One of the things I pride my business on and, and all my business acumen is, is I run business based on the three P's is what I call it. The first P is product. We have a great product. Um, to have a good product, you have to have the second P, which is process. You have to have a good process. And that's one thing that we have, everything down from maintenance to zeroing everything out. So when another engineer comes in, everything is perfect. So mm -hmm. the next guy can pick up seamlessly and the, 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 you know, the artist never misses a beat. But the studio is basically predicated on the third P, which is in business, I think, is the most important is people. Absolutely. I run business based on people, not just the clients, but my staff. I treat my staff like partners. Um, all of my staff, from my chief engineering, with chief engineer all the way down, every one of them started as an intern and assistant, worked their way up, and they've been with me since day one. And it's because of these people is why Power Station does what it does. Right. It's always right. about the people, the relationships, the bond between you know, the engineers and the clientele. And I really think is, look, we have a great product and, and, and we can outperform just about anything else out there in terms of production um, and, you know, come in under budget every single time because of our process and the products. But um, it's the people that really what make that studio what it is. How often do you have outside engineers Often. Uh, come, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that's part of the process is making sure everything is always up to snuff, working, set up, zeroed out. So, you know, an engineer, we, we a lot of times uh, we'll have, you know, separate mix engineers or, or production guys or uh, even other studios are our clients. So let me ask you this then. Mm. It, so if somebody comes down from Nashville and just wants to come in and do a session, do you do you have one of your guys there with I them always have just a, to watch the signal flow? And well, yeah, wherever, because or, look, you know, you, they may not know my patch base right, and stuff. Right. And the time it would take to learn that is cost beyond diminishing return. Right. So we always have an engineer on every session um, that will, you know, we just, they become the assistant at that right. point right. and service uh, the needs of whatever, whatever they need. So is, are, do you have competition? Obviously everybody has competition, but the facility that you have, is there something compatible equal to or better than and down here that makes a lot more noise? Because I don't know a lot of these. So the short studios. answer is no. There is nobody that can compete at the level that we do at the price point that we offer the community. We lower our prices to the local community. The only way that a and I don't I won't mention any other studio names or anything like that. Just you know that's not what I do. But the only difference would be uh, there's there's a couple of other you know legendary studios. They have a little larger live room than we have. So they could do an entire orchestra live where we would have to do the rhythm section and then bring in the string section and then mm -hmm. bring in the, you know, overdub right. the horns and stuff like that, which works better in a lot of cases. Um, but price point wise for all that you have there, I don't really know anybody. Locally. No, they, they, they I really don't. 
No, and and, and people they, they when they see our prices and stuff like that, look, we're we're not here to gouge people. We're, we're it's really about the music. Um, because of the technology plays with Bon Jovi Acoustic Labs, Bon Jovi Medical, and the, our Clear 360 division. There's other revenue coming in. So, that, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not a, I, my pockets aren't extremely deep, but, you know, I, I'm a partner in these companies here. But I make enough to where I can keep the bills paid, the rent paid, the lights on at home. And it's all about reinvesting in the studio and building the long studio. Long-term stuff. Long-term long stuff. Long-term stuff. What's one of the, um, you've been there how many? 20? 20, 23. 23 years. And what is name one or the two of the pro, um, the, the the products that you um, the, the musicians or the product that you've had come out of there that you're super proud of something that was uh, I don't know in the last couple of decades something that stands out to you like either be the one of the orchestras one of the bands that came so, out so you know there's there's a lot of different vast amount of different projects that we do um, you know a couple that really stand out. Um, we did a local project uh, a band that just got signed I think they got signed to Pavement Records. A uh, band called Grin Cynic, rock band. Know them uh, well. You know them I well. Know Grin yeah. uh, you know they Mike just, and those guys. They just played. Uh, yep, they just did it. Yeah. And, and I was supposed to be at that show. Unfortunately, I had a uh, celebration of life thing that I, I, I had to go to uh, in lieu thereof. But uh, um, what kind of music was Grin Cynic? They were like a heavy hard rock. Real band. heavy. Like give me a for instance, like like uh, of like mud, hardcore metal, uh, Metallica. Like a I would say like commercial, commercial hard rock. Foo heavy, Fighters heavy. kind of thing, maybe. Heavy guitars, Foo Fighters. Yeah. Heavy, like heavy, heavy. Great, heavier. good melodies. Heavier. Great melodies. Heavier than, probably heavier than Foo Fighter. Most yeah, of. way heavier than Foo Fighters. Are they a four-piece? Uh, they are a four-piece, yes. A younger band, kids? Yeah. Uh, no, they're, they're, you know, they're like my age. You know, they're And they're badass. 40s, so 50s. What, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get at you is like, um, obviously you, you suggested most of the acts if they could do most of the pre-production before they come see you. And oh, you, they were great with that. I mean, they have their own studio and stuff like that. And actually, they got a new rehearsal place that they just... Have you been down there yet? I'm the one who went in originally. I know, but have you done it since, since they finished no, it? No, It's awesome. Yeah. They did a great job down I saw, there. I saw a video of it. Yeah. It looked great. So looked they do great. all their pre-production there. And yeah. so they know what they're going to do before they come into the studio. For, for the people out there listening, for acts that would want to work at your studio or any studio, pre-production is big. Pre-production right? is one of the most overlooked aspects of production. As a matter of fact, and I know we're going all over a million directions. That's okay. So, okay. I'm that guy. Uh, a, just, uh, I think it was after COVID, I had these two gals come come to me, and uh, they wanted to produce. They wanted me to produce a song. Unfortunately, they didn't have the budget. You know, barely had the budget to, to, to for the studio, but they didn't really have the budget for me to come in and produce with them. And but they had this tenacity, and they th these these two gals uh, reminded me of me back then. You know, when I was you know trying to get it all together. And there was just something about them that drew me to them. And I'm like, I got to figure something out. How can I help these, you know, and, and the band was called Day Four. Um, it was Harley and Heather that came, the bass player and the singer that came to me. And one of the things that I, I, I was looking at is how can I do this? I mean, look, at the end of the day, it's time. You got to justify your time and, and there's a cost to time. And so I called uh, at the time, uh, so Rag Magazine, um, which back then was was under different ownership. Um, so I, I called the editor, who was a good friend of mine, Sean. Yeah. And I said, you know, I got an idea. Let me run this by. I said, I want to do a feature on a band that shows the different steps of production. But I want to show it, what's the difference? So the, the, the core question was, what's the difference when a signed label uh, books Power Station to do, to do a record, or when a local artist books the same studio to do their record? And the answer is just budget. You know, they have more yeah. money to do more shit. So, well, what is that more money, that extra money? What does that really buy you? So I wanted to kind of outline that process, but in the reach of the local musician. So we agreed to do this over three issues. So it was a three-part thing. So the first part of the, the first article was all about pre-production. So I went in with the artist, uh, with the, the whole band, and we reworked the tunes. And you know, of course, that you know, like like any local band, when they come to some of you, it's like they got this song that's like 40,000 minutes long, and there's like 15 songs in one song, and it's like it kind of meanders all this stuff. So, you know, as, as a producer, you know, I, they used to call me Robster Craw because I'd just be cutting crap out. Uh, all right, let's move this around. Okay, you know, this part here, you're playing over top of the vocal. So we walked back in and, and we we did the arrangement. We got the arrangement that that seemed to make sense and fit the song. Uh, I sat with Heather and worked with lyrics. 
you know, how does this song flow? What's the message to the listener? And, right. you know, you know all about this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, you do yeah. this day in and day out. No, no, it's true. So, though. But, it's so true. we worked out. And, and so, so all of it was about the pre-production. The second article was about the recording process. And so I brought in, you know, I, I, I kind of went out and because, you know, since the budget wasn't there, but the exposure from, from the magazine article would subsidize, right. so made it worth it. So I brought in drum checks. I brought in guitar techs. We spent, you know, several hours on the drums. I mean, we get a drum setup that's massive in like 30 minutes, you know, but I, I wanted to, you know, I was using it as a teaching element for my assistants and things like that. So we spent a shit ton of time on the drums, got the drum sounding massive and huge and did the same for the bass and the guitar. Um, Adam, the guitar player, uh, really good guitar player, really good ear. Um, he had a certain vision that he wanted to reproduce on, I still call it tape, even though yeah. everybody's in Pro Tools. But uh, So when I say tape, I mean Pro Tools. Or yeah. But you do have tape. Though, I do right? have tape, yes. <laughs> Matter of fact, I just met with a tape manufacturer yeah. on the way here about- Just uh, not many people use it, but you many, do have but tape. But we have full tape yep. services. But uh, So you know, we spent a bunch of time experimenting with different amps and different setups and things like that. So the second article was about the recording process and the overdubbing and stuff. And then the last article was going to be about the mix and, and all the clever things that I do when I produce a, a label level mix. Um, and then um, associated with that, they were going to release the song. They released the song with the article on, in the magazine. And you still did some print versions back then too. Um, but back to the core thing is that first article was about the pre-production. And, and if there's any advice that I can give any musician out there, I don't care if you're recording on your on your cell phones or whatever. It doesn't matter. Record the stuff. Even recording your band practice and step back and take an analytical approach. Does it make sense? You know, lyrics are, a, are one of the things that people fall short on. It's like, look, you're not going to have this little gnome sitting on, on the listener's shoulder explaining what the song's about. Make sure the lyrics tell the story. They paint the picture. Yeah. Make sure the lyrics have rhythm and they're poetic and, and, and all of those things. So, lyrics are always you know, the toughest thing. That's the song. When, I, when, I, when I first moved to Nashville and I actually sat with a guy that's all he did was lyrics. Mm -hmm. He didn't play an instrument. He didn't sing. He didn't do melody. The Bernie he did Toppin. nothing. Yeah, I, uh, I was just going to say Bernie, Bernie Toppin. Toppin of Elton John. <laughs> you know, gonna uh, I'm gonna, a really fast, funny story. Which we're dating ourselves, by the way, by that rapper. Uh, okay. yeah. That's yeah. That 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 people worth watching it, it that's anyway. That's worth it, absolutely. But I'm going to tell you a quick, funny story how important lyrics are. So my buddy Dennis and I, we still do production together today. We, we go to meet with this guy. He worked at, um, uh, Charlie Pride had a building and Tim McGraw's uh, producer, Byron Gallimore, had a publishing company called Song Garden, I believe it was. So that's where we were going to meet the guy. So right. we thought, oh, this is big. This is our first time ever doing this. And uh, I had just moved to Nashville. So we, we were like, obviously a little nervous, but I made sure we had three ideas. Right. I had a ballad piano idea, I had an up-tempo, and then I had a guitar riff idea. Right. I figure out a three of them, hope, yeah. hopefully. But it, Cover that, all bases kind but of But a thing. lot of, and we didn't know this at that time, guys write from like 10 to one, mm -hmm. or 10 to two, or two to four, or two to six rather, or two to five, and then they'll come in, some guys, well this guy did three. So we caught him on the third session of the day. So we get in there and um, introduce ourselves, blah, blah, blah. We know, all the, we know the same song plugger. That's how we got connected. Right, right. And uh, so he kind of sits over where Jason's at and he goes, all right, guys, show me what you got. Okay. I start with this little guitar thing, a la Keith Urban-ish, you know. Okay, what else you got? I thought, all right, this is going to <laughs> shit her right away. So he said, what else you got? So Dennis, we had this ballad. And, uh, and Dennis is a great piano player and he started this ballad. Nothing crazy, just really cool melodically. He kind of led the vocal melody with, with the chord changes. Right hand, yeah. So anyway, we finish, we look over, the guy's on the couch like this. Oh, <laughs> oh no. no. Oh no. Dennis is to my right, I'm here, and the guy's right there. And I look at Dennis and I, 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 was, I was literally like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> And he pops that up. That sucked. Huh? No, no. But he pops up and he just goes, one girl wants a blue-eyed boy who's self-employed knows his daddy's on. 
Another one wants to be 18, walk out on a silver screen and sing her song. And, and me and Dennis just look like going, what the fuck was that? Oh, he did a Rick Rubin on you. He just. He did he one was, of those meditating shit. And he, he just, I don't know, but I know that we wrote a song <laughs> called Dreams. And about two weeks after we, we wrote it That's or we hilarious. recorded it, oh uh, my it got God. put on hold by Jody Messina at Curb. Oh. Now, unfortunately, about four weeks later, Mm -hmm. getting a song on hold is a whole nother story so we think oh we, we got i just got here we got a song on hold i thought that was right. anyway a few weeks later the head of the a and r department gets fired yeah she was also doing jody's record so uh. it went away. but back to the lyrics <laughs> it was funny as shit dude but man so what you're saying is lyrics so we understand it is you were right you were running this tune through looked like he passed out he was Meanwhile, just, he was sucking it into right another world and he was he shot out lyrics yeah. just like that. Yep. And that's the, a gift. That to, is a yeah, God-given gift. To Rob's yeah, yeah. point, here's a difference. Yeah. When I write with someone and it's in Nashville, it's like every line, every syllable, every rhyme, whether it's a near rhyme, a far rhyme, a perfect rhyme, it doesn't matter. Every, every sentence matters. It's got to yeah. be like a three-minute movie and there is no saying the same thing twice or something. It's different when I write with pop people. Yeah. It's, it's much more, it's a little freer. Yeah. It's not as, um, uh, you know, there's a saying, you got a lot of furniture in the song. Right. Like, I got out of bed, I kicked the dog, I fell down the stairs, I tripped over the coffee cup, I skinned my knee on the way to the coffee Daisy, cup. Daisy, he know. was just joking when he said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what but I mean? You know what? Mm -hmm. Another thing is, too, not to get too weird on it, but listen, I'm a huge Pearl Jam fan. Okay? Sure. I don't know what the fuck those lyrics are. Well, like, that's because they're not, abstract. But you know? I'm just yeah. saying, I'm saying, yes, most of the time, lyric content is super important. But right. when you go if you back want to sell and read records. those lyrics, when you actually read what, you know, what you Oh my God, they're amazing. They're amazing. They're poetry. It's poetry. Look, especially when you find out what it really was. How many yeah. times did you yes. write a song? <laughs> yes. How many times, and we're going to get off this and back to your thing, but how yeah. many times has you, all these years, you had a favorite song? Yes, you and thought you knew it. You thought you connected that because you broke up or you blah, blah, blah. And all the, yeah, and all of a sudden, your hero is on a show, and it's, it's Howard Stern, it's David Letterman, whoever it is, and they're asking. And they're so tell us about, about that, that song. song. What was you're really like, about? And, like, and, they go, and they go, yeah, it was definitely about this. And you're sitting there going, what the fuck are you talking yeah, about? There's yeah, no yeah, way. Yeah. You just ruined it. There's no way. Well, that's why the trick is because when you write a song, it'd be nice if you could pertain it to something uh, that your it, own. It and, is. And come on, help me out here, uh, Rob interpretation well, that's yeah. your interpretation thing. of it, that it lyric is, is and that's well, like when i work with a songwriter and, and and i usually start off the songwriting session is tell me that moment you wrote this song what were you thinking about even if that's not necessarily what the song is about tell me the the motivation behind that because that almost tells me a little bit more where this is going to go right um but at the end of the day the lyric and the melody is the song that is yeah. the song and if there's one thing that i learned that's stuck with me to this day is, you know, I was told, and I, and I do this to, to all my young artists and interns and stuff, what are the three key elements to a hit song? And they'll, they'll come back and they're like, oh, the melody, the groove, and they'll give me, I'm like, that's good, that's good. Let me simplify this. And this is what I learned to this day. The key element to a hit single is the song, the song, the song. It's all about the song. It's all about the song. There used to be a bumper sticker that every car had in, in the music business anyway in Nashville. And it, that's the bumper sticker. It's all about, it's either, it's about the song or it's all about the song. And yeah, that was it. It's it. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't used to writing lyrics and it's a different scenario. I try to tell people when you're writing for yourself and you're writing to put it out there and hope somebody else records it, there's a different process because if Absolutely. you're writing the lyric, it's going to be a little more self-indulgent. It's, it's something that pertains to you more. Oh, now, it may, it may come out to everybody else and it may per be something different. But if I'm writing with you guys and we're writing to pitch to whomever, we're going to find out, okay, are they still drinking? Are they in rehab? Right. Are they still married? How many kids do they have? Did they have an accident you in the Dodge focus truck? Into the and, and, and you got to zero it in yeah. so you don't go over there anymore. You know what I mean? It's like when we have somebody come on and say, anything you want us to stay away from? 
It's the same thing. Well, you know, the funny thing is about all of this is that I think technology plays a huge role in this in a negative way. I mean, I, I'm, I embrace oh, you're, technology. You're 100, but you're 100% right. So what right. happens, so look, back, I remember doing sessions in New York and in and, and different studios, you know, early on, you know, these, these, these motherfuckers could come in and they would play these session guys. I could tell you some funny stories on, on, on tricks that we would do. I'll tell you a funny one really quick and I'll come back to the story, but like what we set up for an orchestra and this is some of the things I teach my engineers, you know, you set all the ch chairs up and you set everything up, you get the drum set up, you, you get the drum sounds beforehand, you get the piano set up. But as the musicians are walking in now, mind you, they're all union scale and union scale is so when they come in, you get a rundown and a performance and you're done. If you want to double something, you got to pay additional for that, you know, double scale, this, that, what have you. So we would come in and, and you know, the, uh, you know, the, the Barry Sachs would come in and we go, all right, you know, let's get levels because they'd be tuning up, you know, warming up and stuff. All right. Then the, you know, the, the uh, violins would come in and you're getting all this stuff on the fly. And this is where an analog console comes in handy because you can't do this digital. So get everybody going up and then, you know, the conductor would come up and everybody would tune in and it. That's you're getting your levels. And what we used to do is uh, when we we're using tape, we would take electrical tape, put it over the red record light. So when they go to do the rundown really quick, hit record, that's your first take. And you had to be this fast to do this shit. And then when they come actually do it for real, bang, that's your second take. You would double it that right, way right. to get to, to circumvent around it. But, you know, with technology, because of, you know, auto tune and editing, that caliber of musician doesn't really exist anymore. I mean, being a musician back in the day was a respectful career because there wasn't many people that can do it. And if you had that talent, you made a good living. But with technology, pretty much anybody, I mean, Daisy could pick up a guitar here and at <laughs> Meta Time, she'd be kicking my ass in the studio. Well, with editing. It, I see, it, with it, editing, I see you're getting that. It's, yeah. it, it's interesting because I have written with people, students, when they start, I always wind up writing the song with them. Mm -hmm. But they're used to writing, they're, find, they're finding tracks on the internet. Ugh. And they're writing over it. And they'll bring the track and show me the song. And I go, where did you get this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they tell me, and I'm like, let's do something a little what different. What about AI? This, you can well, write, you yeah, can, no, I know. That's what AI, I'm getting yeah. at. It. You're 100% right. Because if I put in my AI app right now, hey, I'd like to write a sad song about my, my ex-wife who went into recovery and she passed away. Boom. I Done. mean, yeah. And, yeah. and so I try to back them up and go, okay, can we take this vibe? Yeah, and create something, something unique new. and special. Because this track is from somebody else. Yeah. This is, it's either somebody else's song. But see, that's the problem with technology. And I'm not knocking technology, but it brings more people to the trough that really don't know how to drink. Right. And it kind of homogenizes the situation. And and I, I think that is, is true, too, is, is even in the studio as people come in and with editing and stuff like the performances aren't what they used to be. So, you know, now it's about and I think people fall into this trap because now that they can record a song at home and this and that right in the studio and they, they got something, they focus on one and done and move on to the next, you know, and, and release it before they move on yeah. to the next one. And, and look. How many, how many songs have you written with an artist before you found one that actually worked? Oh, I have a thing. When they come in and they tell me, I just did this with somebody. They come in and I go, well, I want to do four or five, maybe eight. And I go, let's do, the, let's do this. Let's do three. Yeah. And let's see where, it's where we're go. at. And then if you want to do five or six, don't spend any money re in the studio until we write them. Well, and that's what I try to tell these people. It's like, that's where pre-production, we're going back to the pre-production thing is so important. Record the fucking thing yourself so you can actually hear it back and, and make sure it actually works. And then before you go and spend a bunch of money in the studio, write 15 of those things. And because the every best time one. you write, you get a little bit better. Then all of a sudden, this the first one you wrote was your baby. Then the, the song number three, now this is your baby. And then song number seven, it's like you forget about these things. Once you get to that one where the cream starts to rise at the top, then spend money in the yep, studio for absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, so for, for the folks that are, are watching right now, so pre-production, essentially, to, so we don't get too technical about it, is just po polishing the best you can before you actually start the recording process. Make sure the song is intact. You're happy with where it is. Now, a producer, uh, which I just realized through this conversation, you're not just the engineer, you are a producer. So producing is a whole nother thing because you're coming in with different ideas, taking this in, taking this out, get rid of this intro. This verse went on too long. You're putting the pieces together. You're, you're making that cake per se, let's use an analogy because I'm fat. 
So, you know, different, different like parts, cake, different, uh, help me out here. I'm jump in there, Rob. So you're getting different parts to well, put the song you, together where it makes e sense. Exactly. Right? You know, the term producer over the last 25 years is, is completely been screwed, uh, screwed and skewed. Right. Um, you know, the guy that makes a beat type of thing, he's called the producer. That's not really a producer by definition. That's an arranger. But the term producer has kind of been homogenized in the modern production and stuff. So it's a relative term. A real record producer gets in at the conception of the and, song. And starts with you on the table. Oh, and, okay. and basically, so, oh. it takes a song, transform, finds the diamond in the rough, and then transforms that song to where that message and that thought and that heartfelt emotion can be interpreted by the masses. So it's taken, it, it's like you, you come in with a song idea, which is like a, a window with mayonnaise and peanut butter smudged all over it. Um, so the producer's like, all right, well, I like mayonnaise. I like peanut butter, but those two things don't need to be together. They don't, I don't know about you, but I don't like mayonnaise and peanut butter. And if you do, we got bigger problems. So sure. So let's say so they the come in and play a song for you. All this stuff. And, and then you hear that nugget in the middle and you hear that one melody that goes, Oh, that's, that's where funny. find a way to start it See, from there. The intro, not so much. That intro, yeah. a little guitar melody, eh, the verse, eh. The yep. hook, huge. And now you get producers that try to transform yeah. an artist's song into something that's their vision. Now, that's yeah. a bad producer. That's not good. That's not that's a producer. Not uh, a good producer, when I produce an artist, I know this person so well just from the conversations and stuff. I actually, I, you know, when I go to sleep at night, I see their vision. Not mine. I see their vision. So my goal is how do I take my years and decades of knowledge and how do I make that, that, that mm. vision that they have appeal and be be cognizant to the world so yeah. pre-production pre then get in there and mix right or pre-production record then record mix what, what about uh, math you do mastering uh, out of your place or, so, or do you have a mastering guy that you so send th it to? this is an interesting thing on mastering um, it's mysterious it is mysterious in, in, in short well, ex explain to them what in what short mastering but, means so if in you would. short here's what mastering is when you take your final mix that you've mixed in the studio mm -hmm. And provided you got an engineer that knows what the fuck they're doing, it's not fucking rail like you know, you know, trying to make it a, a final radio ready product. That's not the time to do that. But you take the the, the final mix and you send mm. it to mastering. The mastering engineer will go back and make sure that all the levels are are, are consistent. Make sure that the e equalization is consistent, so that way it translates to every format, whether it's streaming, Spotify, whether streaming, it's your iPhone, every, whether it's your earbuds, your home stereo, your, your speaker. That's dock, what mastering whatever. is. That's what mastering is going to do. It's going to put the final polish on it so it translates ubiquitously through any format. So that's what mastering does. Now, do I do mastering? Yes, we do mastering. Many studios will do mastering because, let's face it, the studio tools that we have are very similar and almost the same as mastering uh, engineers have. The biggest difference is the room. The acoustics of, of, a, of a studio control room, a mix room, is far different than that of a mastering lab. Yeah. So the acoustics are gonna be different so they're listening differently. Uh, the tools are a little bit differently. And anytime I mix a record, I will never master anything that I mix, uh, just on principle alone. A lot of studios will do it because they need to bring the revenue in. I'm more interested in the final product over the revenue. And it's, and it's also good to know if they plan on mastering, because ninety percent of the ah, people right. don't know to do 90% it. Ninety percent of the people, first of all, don't know what mastering is, and and when and you try these, to explain it, and most of these engineers will cook the damn mix anyway, so it's just as loud as anything else, and you just don't know that. There's difference. nothing you can do once you've you've you know it's peaking up here. You got to have room to take EQ, the low end. You know, and if, the other problem is is a lot of these new engineers. I, I call them the YouTube. Uh, engineers, because a lot of these guys learn from watching YouTube and stuff like that, which is fine. I mean, look, you know, who would have thought, you know, 30 years ago that you'd have all the answers to the world in the palm of your hand? You can play guitar through your phone. Now. Yeah, it's I mean, crazy. Something I mean, look, just... if I had those tools to learn back when I got started, I'd probably be a lot further on than I am today. But the problem is, is that what a lot of these engineers, they have good ears and they kind of fake it till they make it and they find a process that works but they don't really understand the physics of sound. Let's face it, back in the early days of recording, let's go back to the, you know, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. The guy that was in the control room that was you know, working the equipment, who we call today the recording engineer, well, that term never existed. So there was no such thing as a recording engineer. You know who that guy was back then? 
an electrical engineer. So the physics, you know, sound, light, and uh, electricity are one of the same. It's wavelengths going, it's certain amplitudes going through time. So true engineering is really a, a, a discipline. It's an engineering discipline. And I can't tell you how many times I've come in and I, I, I've come in with one of my young guys and they have all this shit, fucking EQs, pressors, and all this crap on them. I'm like, well, what did you, why are you using this? You know, tell me what was the problem you're trying to fix? Oh, well, I think it needed it. I'm like, look, but it sounds so small. Well, take all that shit off and I'm just going to put more gain into the, the channel and turn the volume down a little bit. All of a sudden, bam, there it is. So, you know, I, I use the reference mayonnaise and peanut butter a lot because they don't go together. So they put all this shit on there because they don't really know the physics of sound and how sound works electrically. You know, it's like you, you've heard the term, you know, that, that hum that comes in, you plug in a bunch of stuff, you get that hum. What the fuck's that coming from? It's 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 a ground loop from the wall. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's that simple. I get that every weekend, by the way. <laughs> a, 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 they in the oh studio call it a sixty cycle hum. The reason is is that's what our ground system is is based on sixty hertz, which is electricity that flows at sixty cycles, rotates, you know, oscillates sixty times a second. So it's getting back in. It's all the same shit, but the newer guys don't know that. So. Sometimes that's one of the problems. Technology becomes the Achilles heel in a lot of cases. I tell people all the time if they want to start engineering their own stuff at home to just do writing and stuff like that, I go, well, what board should I get? Get something with one channel. Put everything you have through one channel at yeah. different times and learn what to do with one channel. Yeah. Learn everything in one channel. Once you do that, you can get 100. It doesn't yeah. matter. Well, like but you, you see that big need one. in the studio. It's the same thing. It's one channel duplicated 72 Just times. Just figure out what to do. <laughs> figure out how to get that signal into one channel and what to do with it. You know, and, and then it, you're, you'll be off to the races. Yeah, and, and, you know, and by doing that too, you, it teaches you know, the person you know, troubleshooting because nothing ever works the first time or the second time or the third time. And, but once you start to learn how to use one channel and how to get in and get out and something's not working, then all of a sudden when you have... 24 channels or 32 channels or 72 channels, all of a sudden your problem solving skills become better. And I focus on that stuff because if you understand, have good problem solving skills in a studio, you're going to be a better engineer because you're going to understand the signal flow and where things go and how to route stuff. And all of a sudden shit starts opening up. And that's the difference between, you know, men and the boys, girls and the women, however analogy you want to use, but it just, it's creating that space and stuff. And it's all understanding your tools and how they work. Yeah, so great this, stuff. This, this is this is years and years and years of a fucking knowledge. shit. Up. Yeah, yeah shit up. <laughs> make a mistake. Let, let me for our uh, viewers out there. So let's say okay, I have a rock band, and uh, I have a, 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 a let's say a couple songs, two or three songs. I have mm -hmm. these songs. We pretty much pretty much are all set to go. I don't want anything from. I don't want to be famous, I don't wanna uh, get on the radio. I just, I have the songs in the simple, simple intro verse, verse, chorus, guitar lead out, old school, 70s hard rock stuff, okay? Load so I go. bring them to you, do you do, a con how does the process work if someone wants to use your facility? Is there a console, is there a, is there so, a set that, do you actually do the? So yes, yeah. so one of the things I always recommend, and, and, and I recommend this to any studio that you're gonna go to, is go visit the studio. Go talk to the studio, the, 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 the engineers, the owner. Look. Get a oh, vibe from them. Yeah. Well, first of all, over the phone, everybody, you know, they got beer muscles. They can do, they promise you the world. Right. But once you meet somebody face to face, you right. shake their hand, you get a vibe for who they are and th their ethics. You know, you, you have that radar, you know, got to, you know, trust that gut. So you go in, you, you tour the facility. So when I bring a client, a new client calls in, I always invite them to do a studio tour. It's always a free thing. Um, I try to do every studio tour myself. Absolutely. Um, you know, so what I do is I bring them into the studio and, and I tell them my goal is, you know, look, my goal is one thing is, is one thing only is to educate you enough to make a good decision. Now, I ultimately hope that decision, we earn your business, then a decision comes to us, but I want you to learn the right questions to ask. And I want you to go to other studios, not just me. So I take the you know, I do a studio tour and I tailor the the tour based on their style of music and things like that. But go and get a feel of what they do, and you'll know in a couple of seconds if somebody really knows what the fuck they're talking about. 
Right. Um, and another thing is listen to some of the things that they've done in the last, you know, 90 days. I mean, most like we won't send anybody's because it's intellectual property. We can't yeah, send yeah, other yeah, people's of course work. Not, yeah. But if it's on there, we'll play it, you know, type yeah. of a thing. So you do a consult. Let's say I want to come in. And also listen I, to things that yeah. weren't done on a major label budget. You know, I'm a local band. I want to listen to the things that other local bands did in here that are on my budget. That's important. Okay, so I have a, I have a thousand dollars. Okay, I have three songs. Okay, all I want to do is go in there, record them. You know, get get the best takes we can and get out of there and mix them down. Um, so you kind of tell them, okay, this is where we're at. We can come in for we're going to do uh, Saturday. We're going to do a four hour session. This Sunday we'll do a four hours. We'll try to get everything in there in those eight hours. We'll take two more hours to mix it down. It'll be twelve hundred bucks. It's on. A, it's, it's and it's a local band. The best we can. So in other words, you're gonna you're, they're gonna tell you kind of what they want to spend. An yeah. So idea. they'll give you their budget. Ideally, if I can hear like a, a rough mix of them rehearsing in their warehouse or something, I can get an idea of you know the level of musicianship and stuff like that. Um, but you know the, the the good thing about our facility is that you know we can isolate everything. Everything is acoustically correct. So we're working with the best sonic qualities to 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 work with to begin with. But, you know, if these guys come in rehearsed, we set them up. I like to track a band with the live band, the entire band. I mean, I get a lot, especially with this, cool. with this modern yeah. music and stuff. You know, a lot of times the drummer will come in by himself with the click track. We do that stuff, too. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but but it, loses a, it loses a certain feel look, you're for a live right. band. Capturing, uh, recording music, I equate to something really simple. Capturing lightning in a bottle. It's capturing a moment in time. And there's nothing better. I mean, we're all musicians here. We've played together, and all of a sudden, something's going to go. You gotta look at each other. And you're like, yeah, yeah. It's that <laughs> interactive vibe, that, and it makes you play even better. And that's why you press. What if you can't stand the guy you're playing with? That's right. What if you can't stand the guy you're playing with? What would the look be then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever that is. What, yeah. What but, if the song's really shitty? Uh, well, you, ever, you ever run into that every once in a yes, while? Yes, we do it all the time. But you know, here's the thing. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm trying to everybody that follows it is in the look. There, there, there's, there's, you know, I'm never going to tell somebody that their song is shitty. No, there's always not, something right? good yeah. to talk about. But what we do as a studio and our staff, we're all producers. So while we're not being paid as a producer, we'll always give suggestions and recommendations. We, we you know, we've talked to the artist enough before they've come in. We know their vision. So. They may think this is the vision. They go from here to there. But we know if you go from here to here, it ain't going to work. So you got to lure them here and around to get what they want. And we do that. And we offer suggestions like, hey, not for nothing, but if you did this, it, it could really or double the guitar, this and that. We'll make the suggestions. We're not the producer. So it's up to them to either, yes, let's do it, or no, I'd rather not. Okay, fine. But you know, we'll deliver the best sonic rendition of what you've got hands down yeah, i've ever had get a kid band in there like uh teenagers in there they come in with the parents they sit you down this is okay we got a song that we want to record kids are really excited this is kind of like what we want to spend and they come at you like with a sick budget and they're like i want to make this right that must be a lot of fun working with the kids do you, do you have patience to, run, to work with kids yes we do a lot of things with kids and, and and i'll tell you one thing that really bothers me with with that um you know look in south florida we have a lot of families here with means and you know some ex-successful musician, rock star, producer, or whatever that was, you know, big in the 70s and the 80s or whatever. And, you know, they get a hold of the parent's ear. And this happened recently, and it wasn't my place to say anything, so I, I, I didn't. But they were paying this guy, and he's from a famous band, and I'm not going to make any names or any references, but they were paying this guy an obscene amount of money to produce a record for this, this, these kids. And I, I, I mean, I, I think the whole budget it ended up being somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, close to six figures. And I'm watching this stuff and the songs were not there. And I'm just like, what ends up happening is these people, they're not making money touring. They're not making records anymore because it's how do you monetize, you know, rec music yeah. any of these days. Correct. So yeah. they're using mm -hmm. their celebrity past to build these parents out and, and just you know, promising them the and world. And they're lining up at one after another. And, and the parents are all in it because this, look, he's successful. He's got golden platinum and Grammys and this, what have you. And they come in and they just start just doing this bullshit. And I'm just like, and I just see it's a money grab. It drives me. And, but meanwhile, you, you, you're making money, but you don't look at it that way. You, you're, you want to get the best look, product. So, so if it's my project, if it's a studio project and the parents come in and, you know, we got million dollars to spend on this, spare no expense. I'm not one of those that go after that. I'm like, all right, hold on here. It's like, look, we can do whatever you want, but 
what is the end game? Let, let's hold back. And my goal is, is like, and I tell people, every dime you spend has to be accountable for something. So as long as the accountability is there and it's honest accountability, the client understands it. In this case, the, the analogy, the parent understands it. I'm fine with it. But, you know, we go back and just, we, we, we one of the things that we're good at, because we've done so much label work and projects like that is, is um, we're good at budgets. I mean, I can't tell you how many record labels I've saved from just accounting records and stuff. You know, they come back after the fact, like, you don't happen to have the accounting records for this session. Yeah, I got it right here. But anyhow, um, we always have a plan. We make sure that cards are always face up. Everybody understands the plan. They understand the budget. In most cases, we come in under budget. That's our goal. You know, everybody comes in with you certain expectations. money. You have to chase money? Nope. I don't run the business that way. So oh, okay. it's, it's uh, <laughs> I'll say it this way in, in, in joke because my, my chief engineer got me the coffee mug, but it says, fuck you, Payne. Yeah. Um, we get paid. Uh, we, we don't run. I don't, I don't do spec. We don't, we, it's, you know, our commodity is simple. It's time. At the end of the yep. time, you pay for the time. That way I'm not chasing you for money. I'm not holding your masters. Everybody's on the same page. And once people start working with us and, and we know we're so detailed in everything, I mean, we keep documents and in, in, in work orders and everything. Um, they learn to trust us. Will you put a, will you put a, uh, it's hard to interrupt you. Yeah. If you, if you see a project that, that comes to your studio, will you take one of your other engineers and say, this is more their forte? Yes. Cause you, you got something else going on and you'll. So every end, so all of our engineers are true engineers. I mean, they've been taught from, you know, gain structure to from electrical, you know, uh, found fundamental electricity all the way up to sound. So they're the real deal. But even though everybody is the real deal in terms of engineering, there's other people that are drawn to different styles of music that understand styles. Like for example, stupid example, punk rock. Everybody says punk rock slop. It's all sloppy, but that's like calculated slop. It, I equate <laughs> that to like back in the yeah. grunge days when they had the sloppy stained up t-shirts in the photos, that look was actually really expensive to pull off. Right, right. So, right. Uh, you know, so, I may have an engineer that has a background of punk rock and understands the evolution of punk rock. I'll put them with that artist. Or if it's a hip hop artist, you know, or, or hip hop, right. you know, somebody that's, you know, more fluent in the programming side of things. And often I'll, we'll flip engineers at different segments of the recording. Right. Um, so we may have one of our, 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 our production guys that will come in and produce the track and then they'll hand it off to the next guy that will, do the vocals and the arranging and, the, and this, and then maybe hand it off to the next guy to do the mix. Um, it all depends. It if, really if depends. They, if anyone wanted to uh, get a hold of you, because now that they're going to be seeing this, um, people are going to want to, if they're inspired to record possibly, mm -hmm. how would they get a hold of you? And what's the best way um, you know, to find out where your studio is and get the information on your studio? So first of all, we have our website, which is powerstationstudios.com. Um, all the email contact stuff comes straight, uh, comes to our staff, but I see everything that goes through. Um, they can call us on the phone, our number is, you know, on the website and things like that. And in all of our socials, um, generally we prefer people, you know, we'll, we'll to, we, we prefer to speak to people, uh, via phone or in person, um, communicating over social media. It's, it's good to make a connection, but it's really hard to understand somebody's vision, uh, behind a screen. Matter of fact, if you send us a message, It'll do an automatic reply to either call us or email us. But uh, those are the best ways, uh, you know, to get a hold how of did us. You, how did you uh, meet Keith? Um, so I met Keith back in the days in Oakland Park. Uh, the original right now Which, rehearsal. Uh, were, you, were you a musician, a working musician? Yep, or, I was a working musician. Were you musician. an original band? Or? Yes, I was always in original bands. What was the name of your band? Because I would definitely. So the, the, the bigger band that I was working with was a metal band that I met Tony Bon Jovi with was a band called Blind Rage. Blind and, Rage. Yeah, we were a heavy metal. like uh would that be early '90s or? Yeah, that'd be early '90s. Early '90s. Early '90s. Why? What about another name of another band? So anyway? then, the project that that I, I kind of went from there into the what st kind of started the studio, uh, that was like kind of a, it was like kind of a no doubt with with more punk rock, less ska, and pop uh, before no doubt was around, and that was that project was called Lotus Blossom. Lotus, are you a guitar player? I was a, a I was a guitar player. Are you, you're still a guitar player? I'm still a guitar player. Do you player. do any session work at all at your place or no? I make guest appearances all the time. Um, as far as formal session work, I mean, I used to do, that's how I got through school was paid, was doing, you know, I was a studio musician. Uh, I was classically trained. 
Um, if I'm in the studio and someone needs a you know guitar solo or this or that, I'm always happy so to do it. So if you're mixing down somebody and everybody left the building and you hear a little part that got a little do it all the time. Jump jump right in there. I just did it the other day. There was a <laughs> there was this R and B R and B artist. There was this music break in there and she couldn't figure out what to what to do in there. One of the guys was mixing it and she just told the guys like you know just put something there that, that you know it needs something. And so he comes out, he's like, hey, Rob, you in the mood to play a little guitar lick? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I came in and ripped it out that time, this, you know, just threw it down in there and uh, did the mix. And she was just like literally off her seat type of thing. But I, I do that all the time. Um, as the owner of the studio, uh, if there's a client in the studio that needs a guitar or something like that, and I happen to be there, I just do it. I right, love to right. play. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and... Uh... I, I got one more question. Okay. I didn't if, do it. You can't prove anything. If, I'm sticking if, to if it. You, if you had an eight-track player in your car, what eight-track would be in there? Which, what's, your listen, what's your listening go-to? If, you're, oh, if you just want to chill and relax, give me, give me an artist that you might want to turn on in your car to listen to. You know, I, it, it's really hard for me to, to answer that because I listen to so many different things. I mean... Look, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a product of an 80s metal guy, you know, any, any hair metal stuff. That's what I grew up on. No shit. I'm a shredding guitar. I was, you know, trying to, how fast can you play? So, you know, I love all of that. I would have never thought but, like, that. Like if yeah. you go into my, you know, I listen to satellite radio. If you, if you go into my car and you look at my programs, uh, it, it ventures anything from, from lithium to yacht rock to talk radio, Howard Stern to... 80s, 90s. You're a Howard guy? I'm a Howard guy. I've been a Howard guy since yeah. I was in high school. Oh, I've been a Howard guy for years. Um, All right, but, great. Uh, you know, Turbo, I, I just, I go through it. You know, music to me, I find myself really gravitating towards lyrics and, mel and melody. Even with my metal band, we always, you know, we had vocals that we were doing three-part harmonies over top of throwdown metal stuff. Um, we had two guitar players. My other guitar player, Sal, amazing guitar player, and we trade off solos and stuff like that. But I would even, you know, if he's doing an A power chord, well, why the fuck do I got to do that? He's nailing it. He's awesome. You know, he's doing it. I couldn't do it any better. So I'll revoice it, maybe do a second inversion or a third. And, you know, I'll yeah. change it up so it opens up the thing. Uh, it, so melody and, and, and stuff like that really. Come on, man. Give me an artist. Would you please? Are we were listening to Skid Row. Were you listening to Rat? Were right, you listening so I, to Metallica? So I, I, <laughs> Give me some Pearl Jam, Foo Fighters. So for the last couple of weeks, I, I've been listening to the new Extreme record. There you go. Uh, I, I'm a big Nuno fan. Um, Nuno is just a. Is that know, a kick ass record? I'll tell you what. Um, you know, I, I've always been an Extreme fan, all the way from you know uh, the first record to Pornography to Three Sides. The thing I like about this record is that it's raw. It's just stripped down, fuck you, song, songwriting and performing. And I think one of the things that Nuno brought to the table, um, you know, and, and is he brought physicality to the guitar playing back. You listen to some of these solos and it's just like, you know, and, and, and it's just raw. It's there. It's just naked, but full. Is he one of the best guitar players out there right now? Absolutely, without a doubt. Yeah, I saw a lot of stuff on it. Didn't they go back to their first rehearsal place or their first studio to record this? I think I saw them all pulling up. Oh, so he, some, I did. I said so. Some barn or somewhere. Yeah, they originally, they did, I saw. I saw that uh, recently. Somebody had forwarded that to me. I think they did this mostly at Nuno's house. Um, the drums may have been done somewhere else. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to research it. I know Three Sides was done here at Fort Lauderdale, New River. Remember New River right, Studios yeah, yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. It's, that it's, Virginia? Was that No, no, right here in Fort Lauderdale. New River. Right, New right. River no, Studios. I know. I'm saying the lady that owned it wasn't her oh, name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Virginia. Yeah. Virginia. yeah. yeah. Um, they, they're, they're long gone. I, I'd done a bunch of sessions there back That's not still there anymore. Oh, it? no, no. Yeah. It's long gone. Well, let's, let's take a break. We're going to take five, and we're going to come back, and we're going to include and get out of here, and we're going to be right back with Rob Roy. Everybody stick around. Hey, hey.
Hey everybody, welcome to Soundcheck. Welcome back to Soundcheck. Episode two, season two, with Ryden Hour, Robinette, and Jason Sedowy. And we're back with yeah. Rob Roy. Come on, keep it, keep it going. Keep on going to work. Rob right. Roy. <laughs> Rob Roy is here, and I cannot even believe that oh he's boy, in. Oh boy, oh boy. The sound check <laughs> studio right now in my fucking house. Yeah. I got baby. a rock star. Rob, I'm really happy that you had an opportunity to come here and be uh, with us today. I'm pleasure. sure it's been a your blast. schedule is very busy. I do have one question for you. And you can't say, oh, you know, there's so many. I need an, I need a, an answer. Here we go. <laughs> right. I personally know, if I'm on my motorcycle, that one album that I can listen to for some effing reason over and over. It doesn't matter how many times you listen to it. Uh, and there's a few of them. I can listen to Physical Graffiti as one example. I can listen to Asia. Asia, for, I don't know what it is. Right. And it, and it really doesn't matter Great the mood. Great musicians. It's a frame to, of mind, too. Uh, you know? Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Deja Vu. I, got, I just got chills. Neil Young, everybody knows this is nowhere. Every single song can put me in a place when I was a kid. And, and uh, um, uh, dirt, uh, Brown Dirt Cowboy, uh, um, you know, Elton John. What is one of those albums you think from your classic days of growing? I don't care what genre it is. Is there one that you can listen to over and over that you think is kind of a masterpiece? There's a bunch of them. And, and again, it, it depends on your mood. And, and Let's say and, you're, in, you're hyped up. You're ready to go. You're you know, kicking ass. Give me an idea. Yeah, you can. Uh, you, some old Motley Crue. Uh, there you go. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. shit. Some old Are you Motley kidding? Crew, uh, yeah. Give me an album. Uh, you the know, first one, even. The first Public one. Public Enemy. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Or Too Fast for Love. Too Fast uh, for Love. Even, you know, uh, you know, when they would do, when they, Dr. Feelgood was a great record. Yeah, but the first was, album. Yeah, yeah, but I like Dr. Feelgood. There Feel wasn't Feel one Dr. song Feel on that was, first album that I thought was just no. shit. Yeah. There was there was something about Doctor Feelgood though that me personally I really locked into. That. Yeah, Isn't that funny, here, man? There was something. You know? I mean, you see all these old guys. I was, and it's funny. Like, I was is, a big Def Leppard fan because oh, it's I all loved my, how the guitar players, you know, Phil Collins, and Steve Clark used to intertwine with each other. High and dry. Uh, high and dry. But, I mean, before before Parma, like when they started out with uh, with Pete Willis. Yeah, 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 they those were guys. all great, without a doubt. I can't tell you how many times I listen to Hysteria. Oh, it just with the headphones on. Brilliant. Every time you, you, you yep, hear something new. Every, every time. Every time. There were so many guitar parts. And I know that time, album from a production standpoint, like the back of my hand. And and, and I was I was still pretty young when that came out and I, I wore a couple of cassettes of that fucker out. What year could that have been? Late 80s? 88? 87? Yeah. What, what, what about uh, um, I had another question somebody asked me. Um, Operation Mind Crime is another one. Oh. You know what? Quick story. Uh, I was a, I was a Queensryche guy and I saw them at the uh, at the Pompano Amphitheater. Right. And it rained so hard. I don't even know how the concert even they played. And I remember we, they were selling ponchos. So the whole <laughs> crowd was ponchos. Half of them left. There might have been 200 people there. Jeff Tate era. But this yeah. is years ago. So I was working for a insurance company. Uh, well, this had to be uh, 15 years ago. Yeah. But yeah, amazing concert, pouring rain. So what, what is uh, one of your uh, best concerts um, ex experiences that you remember uh, growing up that you... When you walked out of there, you were just like, holy shit. All right, so I'm going to tell you happened? from a different perspective, not just the normal going to a show. So back when I was with Blind Rage, all we wanted to do was get backstage and meet some of the promoters. And so I didn't give a fuck about the bands or something. So um, Zeta, uh, 97, or was it 94.9 Zeta back in the mm -hmm. day, which was the Fort Lauderdale Rock Station. They had their Zeta Fest every year. I've been to Zeta Fest, yeah. So, um, now, when we used to tour as a band, we did it all ourselves. We had we had an RV, we had a trailer, the whole nine yards. So we would end up, we found out that we could take the RV and pull right into the backstage. And they wouldn't even, you go early enough, come on, you just take your part of the crew. So yeah. of doing this, we would just make our way backstage. Now, for Zeta Fest, you had the RV thing, then you had the VIP RV section, which led to the backstage. And you had to have credentials and stuff like that. And I was pretty brazen, you know, back then. Still am now, but uh, I'm like, how the fuck are we going to get back there? So, you know, when we toured, and this is before GPS and all of that stuff. So, you know, we had the maps and we had a couple of maps that were laminated and stuff that we'd sit there and, all right, take this route 30. Isn't that funny, man? The maps. So I, <laughs> so I cut a fucking rectangle out of this fucking map. I take the fucking shoelace out of my fucking Doc Martin, <laughs> put it around my neck and this and that. 
And we, I said, I go, uh, and I said, so let's just walk in. Let's pretend we're having a conversation. And as we walk in and I just do this real quick and just keep walking like nobody's business and we're there. And then, oh, came turn. I came back. I'm, and I'm back in and I haven't even gotten anywhere, but I'm coming back and forth. And, uh, and uh, I came back with, you know, I came back with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of drinks and I was like, oh shit. I'm like, so I go to the garden. Like, Can I leave this here for a second? So I, he saw me in and out, in and out. Right. So at that time he didn't even question. So we're in and we're going out and we're doing this. And, and, you know, I, I I've done this a bunch of times. I actually walked into Melissa Etheridge's uh, uh, dressing room by accident one time at, at, at the Palm Beach Amphitheater or whatever, but this was down at Fort Lauderdale. So I'm going back and forth. And so I end up on the stage, I'm side stage. And then I, I, I walk into, I, you know, I met the guys from Def Leppard. I'm hanging out in their fucking trailer and this and that. And, you know, I've met those guys probably a dozen and a half times. And, and so we're hanging out, we're shooting the shit and all this stuff. And, and, uh, so then I'm out doing all this other stuff. And then at that time, uh, Zeta's morning show was, uh, uh Paul and young Ron yeah. and omelet was their sidekick, you know, producer sidekick. Oh, yeah. And uh, they used to, we, we used to end up, because they used to do local shows and stuff, and we were on all those, and they used to call me and my guitar player the promo guys, because we showed up at every Zeta uh, fat, and we were giving oh, away Oh, you cassette. were the annoying guys? No, no, no. They kept holding on the flyers, flyer, 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 flyers? No, no, no. no? Uh, we were giving away cassettes oh, and, and, and stuff like that. We were giving well, away t-shirts. We walked out, and, and we were just giving the shit away to the point where after a while, they're like, well, here, just bring it here, and we'll give it out with you. You know, because it's just more swag for them. Right, right, right. And the fact that we're not trying to give out flyers and bullshit, but we were giving away, you know, beer coos, anything we could put I our band you. name on. Right. In our, back then, we even had a website back then, and, you know, type of a thing. So anyway, back to this, you know, Zeta Fest, we're back and forth. And so I'm coming back out and I'm talking to Omelette and he's like, dude, I'm trying to get my girl backstage because she's a huge Def Leppard fan and they won't let her back this way. They won't even, I'm like, yeah, but this is your festival. They're like, yeah, they won't let us, we don't have the credentials back there. I said, I got this. So I grab his girlfriend, I bring her backstage, and I walk right into the fucking Def Leppard fucking uh, 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 <laughs> Def Leppard uh, t- uh, their, their uh, RV, because they're RVs for their dressing rooms, and introduce them. This is this, you know, Omelette, who's one of the hosts of the show. This is his girlfriend, so and so. I wanted you to introduce you guys. And she hung out there for like an hour, this and that. And so the next day on the radio, it's like, you know, Rob, these promo guys from Blind Rage, they got my girlfriend in the <laughs> So we did all the fucking thing. And I was just you like, guys are rock stars like, again. Yeah. <laughs> that was worth it. But, you know, it was one of those things. It's like we just wanted to meet people to get our foot in the door. Yeah, but you got to tell me the concert. What is the concert, man? Oh, I'm talking about promoting okay, your right. band. But it was a Def Leppard concert. Listen, I just went and saw Tool two years ago. Oh, Cook, they were, they were great. I'm not even a Tool fan. I can't even tell you one cool Tool song. Ah, wow. When I walked out of there, my heart was pounding, and I thought I just saw one of the most amazing performances of live music I've ever seen in my life. That's what I'm talking about. Does something jump out at you? Um, there has to be. It just, you know, I have such a bad memory sometimes because well, of all the stupid shit that I've done. I, oh, I got one. I was out in Denver, Colorado, uh, with my girlfriend at the time, and um, this one was uh, so I, I saw um, um, the Cure at Red Rock. I wasn't a Cure fan, but Red Rock is cool. Oh my God! When I saw them and just watching, and they're they're a great band at Red Rock. I was blown away. Just it was just like just everything kind of in, and then you know now my brain's starting to work. Another one. I was out in California, and and she liked going to shows, so she talked me into going to uh, Lady Gaga. And this was back when she first came out uh, with Poker Face and stuff. And I'm like, not my cup of tea. I'm like, all right, fine. So we went there. The opening act was this, uh, this, lo- this I don't know if they were local out there, but it was, uh, I think the band was called Semi Precious Metals. Blew me away. These guys were amazing. Had and nothing to do with the shrooms you were taking or no, the, no, I the was dope totally, you were smoking. I was sober as sometimes as a, that does help. Well, you know, but I don't, so you know, I could do a couple of those shows, but right. I don't remember the show. I just remember being <laughs> fucked up. But, uh, um, but when Gaga came out, I was just so no blown away. I mean, and it's not necessarily music I would normally listen to, but you know, we had great seats and I was just so captivated by the way her energy and how she connected her songs with the audience and her band was just fucking amazing so there's there, there's you know you know one of the best ones i ever saw and this is going back to mutt mm-hmm. shania twain oh i would love to see shania Dude, twain when i saw that concert i was just first of all the band 
Oh yeah, it's it. It was you could tell it was a mutt thing. I mean, you could. I don't know if they were oh, doing because tracks he produced on, all his wife's stuff. Yeah. All yeah. of it. Oh yeah, it was uh, yeah, 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 yeah. crazy. I'm a big mutt fan. Everything from the ACDC stuff all the way up to you know. Uh, Get out of my car. Oh, dude, into my dreams. See, yeah. I, I I went to uh, B52s, Joan Jett, and the Who, Orlando. I remember, for like '82, I got kicked out of school. My mother still didn't know yet. I was faking my way. And I went to that, and I remember seeing that. Just jumps out at me. Now we're talking about. I'll tell you, Joan Jett was here at the uh, Coconut Creek Casino. Oh yeah, I saw it. I was there. Long ago. Um, and you know, uh, one of my buddies, our clients in the studio, is uh, uh, his cousin's the keyboard player manager. So uh, ended up, I brought my girlfriend. I was sitting on stage. I was as close from here to 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 the chair there uh, of Joan Jett playing. And so I got to watch the. You know, we watched this right from side stage. So I that, saw a Jelly Roll there. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah he was right. just was there. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Teresa took me. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Teresa. Teresa Sanders took me to a jelly roll. And, uh, nice. Yeah, so he was there. But anyway, I see Tesla there. That was a, it's pretty cool what they do there. You're talking about when they set Tesla. up outside, right? Yeah, yeah. outside Big there. Stage. It was a great they put thing. the seats Tesla, out there. I've seen Tesla back in the day. They were a great band. That they was, opened they up were, yeah. for, um, I think it was Bon Jovi back then. They I opened saw up them for with Whitesnake once. Yeah. Well, I see, we, that was a great era, man. There yeah. was just a lot the, of great concerts. A lot of great concerts. You know, one that I didn't like, and I'm probably going to get shit on for saying this, but, you know, I, 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 I was a big, uh, um, you know, Neil Peart fan and, and Rush. When I saw Rush live, I wasn't into where, where, Which one did you see? Um, which, I forget when, tour? but it was a Coral, I call everything Coral Sky up there, whatever yeah, it's yeah, called it's, now. Yeah, it's called I Think. Financial. I Think, yeah. So, and we had lawn seats out there, but it was like, you could have just put the fucking CD in. It was so perfect. You know, I kind of ran into I, that like, on a couple like bands that, where they changed it and they, they, you know, they fucked things up and that that human connect. They were so fucking perfect. I then I just got. It was a little up. generic. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you I know, I felt that way when I just saw ZZ Top. I saw ZZ Top twice there in the last two oh, years. I saw that one. I saw ZZ Top just in Vegas one it, time. Man. ZZ Top did not. I, I saw him at the Hard Rock like uh, six. Oh, eight months same ago? three chords, same uh, three well, guns. No, but that's okay. But, but we saw him with Leonard Skinner. Yes, but I just saw him at the Hard Rock. Oh, I uh, saw him with. Oh Leonard. no, wait a second! I just saw him with Skinner again. I saw him with Skinner over here, and I saw him with Skinner over here. I was There's shocked. Something, you know I was what, shocked. Man? The drummer just seemed like I got places to go. Well, for How me, can it I was, get out of here, for man? me, it it's, was this. They were they uh, Skinner opened, mm -hmm. and just totally kicked it, killed ass. it, man, killed it. ZZ Top came on. I was really, I mean, I had one of them twenty dollars drinks. So it was a hundred and twenty degrees. Was it one hundred and twenty hey, degrees? It was, yeah, and, suffocating and, hot. But when they came on, the first song, everybody, we had a lot of the kids with us. They were all having a great time. Uh, and there's probably five or six adults sitting here, and everybody's looking at me. Dude, what, what the fuck is wrong? I go, I, I, I don't know. know. Maybe it's a new sound, man. Oh, I remember. Me and you talked yeah, about it yeah. on the show. Yeah, it was something was just, everybody was getting up um, and leaving. All the people with you know, us I'll tell you another like, thing it was. It sounded very condensed. Intense. like Almost a, like it was in well, mono. You, I was recently, so Nile Roger from, Nile Rogers from Chic, um, I've met him a bunch of times. Uh, I've been to his house up in, in Connecticut and stuff. They were playing, and you know he produced all the Duran Duran stuff, David Bowie. And it, it, I mean, the list goes on. He's a master. Um, one of my biggest influences in a insane guitar player. But he was uh, he was doing a tour recently. This was last year, I think, and uh, with Duran Duran. I've seen Duran Duran probably ten times. They're great live. This time they played a bunch of obscure shit off the new record that was just weird. And so Niall goes on first, and oh my God, his band is insane. They blew this place up. I was, uh, Jerry Barnes is the bass, bass player, is a friend of mine. I texted him afterwards, uh, after the show. But um, so when Duran Duran came on, I'm, you know, you're in this energy, a couple beers. We're like, yeah, you know, and Duran Duran's a great band. I love Duran Duran. Let me Duran tell too. you what, and I, I love them, uh, you know, live. They're a great live band. But uh, when they came on, I swear to God, it was like they were watching their watch while they're playing. Like, okay, <laughs> 10 more minutes. It was the most, I mean, it was like, you know, you're expecting a fucking rock hard fucking thing. It was like yeah. limp. Yeah. You know what? Before yeah. we go, I got, it just reminded me of something. We saw, this is a while ago, another really great sounding concert. And I'll probably get shit thrown at me for this. We went to see Nickelback. Let love me Nickelback. tell you something. I love it. They I like Nickelback. fucking kicked ass. It sounded They're so crazy. tight. Crazy. It yeah. was so good. Yeah. It was almost like, are they really playing? 
I thought that too. I thought they, they said just were. like a record. Well, they get shit on because they got millions of records sold. They're great. They're a great I don't band. Give I, don't a give, I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Know, they are a great band. What about Jason? Jason. Jason. <laughs> What's your favorite? I mean, you don't have to get the too detailed. Is there a concert that stands out to you? Because one, you know, you're part of the show. Well, thank you. <laughs> what, what concert stands out to you uh, where you just were like, holy shit, this really just happened? Well, there were a couple, but a, an early one was um, I got to see Guns N' Roses before they were anything. They were opening for Motley Crue. Oh, wow. Uh, like, where, where at? Here? Down here? Yeah, down South Florida. Down here. You remember I where forget, it was? I forget where it was. I wasn't even driving. So they came up this before Appetite or right when Appetite came out? Uh, Ap it might have been out, but it hadn't blown up yet. They were pretty much like unknown. That could have been the old Miami Arena at that point. Yeah. yeah. It might have been, yeah. Down in Overtown. And, but they, they fucking kicked ass. I and mean, are I, you a Guns guy? Too? I'm a Guns guy, yeah. See, I, I like this because... If speaking to him, just meeting him today, you know, when you hear the conversation, the knowledge he has and the history he has, and then he says, I'm an 80s metal guy. I mean, I love that shit. Listen, I play with a guy, I play with uh, two Brazilians okay. in my band. And they're, you know, they, they, you just, you wouldn't think. I mean, we, we, we play music for a living. So he plays all different styles, you know, could be Michael Jackson, Bruno Mars. You know, and I play in a southern rock band with the other guy. They're both metalheads. Yeah. That's where they grew up. They came yeah. from the fucking, you know, core. That's why you see Iron Maiden go down there and they have like just hundreds of thousands of, of people at every freaking show. Yeah. You know? Are you an Iron Maiden guy? I am an Iron Maiden guy. Are you, are you, are you Nico ever done anything at your place? Yeah, at all? he's done a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I figured well, I, he would. I, I co produced a, a, a track with him with a band called Voices of Extreme. Uh, Nico's, he's awesome. He's awesome. If there's a, uh, before we, before we close out, I'm going to let you finish. I just had no more question. Is there someone in your studio? I know you had hundreds and hundreds of people there. Is there that one moment when someone got on that microphone, the sing and you went, there's something different like that stood out. And is there anybody yes. that ever made it out of your studio that ever got nationwide recognition that they deserved? Is there anybody that came out of your studio at all? Like, it's ended up on the Voice, American Idol. Uh, we used to do uh, a lot of the American Idol Voice, you know, can, you know, people, and then uh, we actually worked with a lot of them. I worked with uh, Wendy Moten, who was uh, on. Uh, I think she was on. Um, I think it was American Idol. She came in second. Right. Um, talented, talented singer. Amazing singer. Great person too. Um, Is there one of those voices that yeah, you thought so was? Something extra special. So we just did area. another record with uh, his name's Joe Bwari, B W A R I E, um, and this guy has just got a voice that it just like falls out of the speakers. Um, we've done a couple. I did the first record I did with him. I actually tracked it at Power Station New York. And we came back down here, did all the overdubs of uh, music, and then I mixed it down here. Uh, he just did another record. He uh, ended up cutting the record at East West in California. Um, brought the tracks here and we did his vocals uh, and he just launched the record. Um, this guy is just, I mean, if you take Frank Sinatra, you take, I don't even know what, what kind of music is it. He's like a, he's like a big band jazz guy, like big band, yeah. but this record's different. It's like kind of, it's got the orchestral back foundation, right. but it's got more of a pop you know, commercial like side of things. Buble. How many years ago was this? It makes by the Michael Bublé. This is we just finished the record uh, and last spell, month. Spell his last name again for me. Joe Buari, B W A R I E. So this guy, when I first met him, he was actually in on uh, on Broadway. He was the played Frankie Valley in Jersey Boys uh, on Broadway. Uh, so you know, you knew, you already knew he could. sing. Oh yeah, he could yeah, sing. Yeah. But you know, he's doing this, the, and he does the four season stuff. I mean, just amazingly. I, I saw the show when I was working on his record. Um, he had he's from here? He's from California. He's a Pasadena guy. Oh, okay, okay, um, but gotcha. uh, I met him in New York uh, when we were working on the record with Charlie Colello, as a matter of fact. But uh, this kid, just it just he draws you in with his voice like nothing I've ever no heard. Kidding. Oh, wait a second. If it's a guy from the Jersey Boys, and I've heard him on TV. I mean, I've heard the Jersey yeah. Boys. Yeah, yeah his last record they did, he was on all the morning shows and stuff. It good looking up. kid. Yeah, well, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. good looking guy. A real, I was actually for Nam. I was out at Nam and uh, uh, met up with him for him and my girl. We met up for dinner out there. He's a good friend. Um, he just finished his record. I hooked him up with a mastering engineer, uh, Dale Becker, who's like one of the most brilliant mastering engineers on the fucking planet. But uh, got him to master the record and he just released it last month. Oh, we'll have to check it out. Matter of oh, fact, you... Jimmy was on the record. We brought Jimmy in to do some guitar. Jimmy, <laughs> oh, Jimmy really? oh, no kidding. 
Yep. Uh, Why do we a, always got to give this guy? There's a, plug? a video out there that he did uh, that Joey did as a promo video that Jimmy's in the video, which reminds me, I told him I was going to send him that link. Jimmy, I'll get that to you if you <laughs> see this and I haven't got to you. Text me. Do you know who Chad <laughs> Smith is? Yeah. I'm going to see Chad Smith tonight. That's why we got to close the house. Oh, cool. All and right. Chad Smith, the Chili Peppers yeah. tonight. Yeah. Very so cool. So I got to get there and get going. And uh, Keith, you great wanna, seeing you, brother. Keith, you want to close this out? Tell yes, us. I will. Yes, oh, I will. Do? So I want to hear. I want him to play a little bit of guitar. If you could just play. Pluck, pluck a couple chords while you're taking us out. Keith? No, I want to hear him play first. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working hard on this new one here. All right, this. Cool, cool, yeah. Well, that's Rob Roy from the Power Station, baby. Anyway, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is episode two with our good buddy Rob Roy, owner of the Power Station in Pompton, Florida. Com Pompton. Pompton. Hey, don't, hey, all you Pompano people that come see We're me, just goofing. do not take any offense to that. Yeah. I don't want to lose any I'm of the from few. Pompano. <laughs> well, anyway, so thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in once again. The episodes just keep getting stronger and stronger. We want to make sure that you hit the subscribe button. If you hit the subscribe button, you Smack will get $5,000 cash sent in a small envelope to your house. So make sure you subscribe now <laughs> for me, Jim Robinette, and Jason Sedowie. And not Randy, but Keith Ridenauer. <laughs> Don't get the two mixed up. That's not red. And that's Rob Roy from Power Station, Station Studios. Studios. Thank you so much Thank for tuning you. in. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. My pleasure. It was fun. Yeah. yeah.